This character, Samson, in your Bible uh, is a popular character, especially in all the children's storybook Bibles. You know, is this rippling muscle, long-haired, you know, movie star, superhero kind of guy who, who literally brought the house down, right? He's a he, muscle man. But as we, after we took a closer look in Scripture, we find the Bible never says that he had big muscles or broad shoulders. In fact, no one could even figure out where his strength came from. It came from the Lord, if you were listening. But, so we don't know what he looked like, but we presume he probably didn't look very strong because everybody was scratching their head at how this guy could do these tremendous feats of strength. Uh, his hair was long and uncut, um, but not like in a cool way, but like he didn't have a haircut for his whole life, all right? So it was probably ugly. The Bible says it was braided into seven braids around his head. Um, just probably not the Hollywood superstar that we would like to depict, you know, in the Christian comic books. But nonetheless, uh, Samson grew up in a time where in, in the popular culture of the day, people didn't do what was right in the sight of the Lord. They, didn't, they did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. In fact, the story takes place in the book of Judges and we find seven times through the book of Judges it says the people did evil in the eyes of the Lord. However, in their own eyes, Judges tells us twice, that everyone did what was right in their own eyes. You will see pretty quickly how well that turns out, right? When everybody just does what's right in their own eyes. You do you, I'll do me, it's right for you, it's wrong for me. Let's make it up as we go along. I'm just gonna stand in my truth and you live your truth, whatever, yeah. It's, it's become popular language now again, nowadays, in our culture, um, as something, <laughs> it cracks me up, it's as, as something as if it's progressive, right? Let me tell you something. Uh, living your truth is not progressive at all. At all. I mean, well, for three glaring reasons. Number one, well, it's old. It's literally 3,000 years old. The book of Judges is 3,000 years old. It's not a progressive idea to just, well, everybody live their truth and do whatever's right in their own eyes. That's not a new idea. It's old. Secondly, it, it's, it's, it's disingenuous to claim that now as an excuse for immorality, but then hold history accountable for their immorality. I mean, if I stood up here and said, well, the slaveholders were just living their truth you would say, no, they were wrong. Well, how about that? Right? It is not an excuse for immorality. And third, the third reason why living your own truth is not a progressive idea at all is because you don't have to read much to find out. It ends tragically every time. It ends horribly. That's the opposite of progress, right? It's actually socially destructive behavior. In, it destroys a society. Plain and simple. In black and white, read your Bible. That's how it ends. We've joked about this in the past. You can't just erase all the lines on 95 and just leave a wide open road and everybody just travel however fast they want, wherever they want on the wide open road. It would be a parking lot. It would be a pileup. It would be a disaster. You have to subject yourself to some objective reality and some objective rules in order to get from point A to point B. There has to be some lines in the road. There has to be some speed limits. There has to be. And literally, to get from point A to point B is progress. That's how you move forward. Not the removal of rules and everybody does what's right in their own eyes. So that is the culture in which 
Samson was born, but he was born into, well, a devout, God-fearing, God-worshipping set of parents. A set of parents who couldn't have kids. Yet an angel came. We believe this angel to be Jesus. That's another long theological rabbit hole, but the angel said, you're going to have a son. It's a miracle. And they commit to raise this son in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Baby Samson. And the Bible says, even from a baby, the spirit of the Lord was stirring in him. Now they were part of the tribe of Dan. They were called Danites. How about that? Anybody here named Dan? You could start your own tribe. That'd be cool, right? The Danites were a pagan tribe. They worshiped pagan gods. Samson's parents were not. They lived in a culture that was dominated by the Philistines, another pagan culture who worshiped Dagon, but not Samson's parents. They were committed to worshiping the Lord, the one true God of Israel. So much so, they prayed, they prayed together, They heard from the Lord, both of them together. They communed with the Lord together. They worshiped the Lord together. They fell on their face together. This is all in Judges chapter 13. And they raised their son together. Mom and dad on the same page. Must be nice, right? (laughs) No, that's how it's supposed to be. Even when Samson gets older and and starts to buck their, their values and their traditions, mom and dad together, come to try and set him straight. A lot of marriage goals in there for a bunch of us, right? That being said, part of their commitment to the Lord in raising this boy was to raise him uh, under what is called a Nazarite vow. There's nothing to do with Nazareth or being a Nazarene. A Nazarite vow is just... It's a religious vow that is made uh, to abstain from things like alcohol or anything related to a vineyard. You abstain from uh, any contact with something dead, which we're going to see in a minute. And you abstain from cutting your hair. Those are kind of the three big ones of the Nazarite vow. It's not uncommon. A lot of people in the scriptures would do this temporarily. Even people today do it temporarily. Some of you are observing Lent, right? Or you abstain from something between now and Easter. We get it. Sometimes, you know, if you have a big decision to make or something's going on in your life and you want to pray and fast for a few days, you kind of have a vow of, of fasting, right? There's nothing, nothing unusual about taking a vow so that you can just spiritually focus on something and prepare, consecrate, if you want to use that word, uh, yourself. That's cool. But Samson was under a lifelong Nazarite vow. So that's kind of getting us up to speed through Judges chapter 13. Today, I'm going to start reading in Judges chapter 14, if you have your Bibles. Judges chapter 14, and we're going to work our way through this chapter. We started it last week, but I'm going to kind of start back at verse 1, just so you see uh, the progression of events here as we begin to dissect this story. (coughs) Judges chapter 14, beginning in verse 1, says, Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. And then he came up and he told his father and his mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. Verse 3. But his father and mother together said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives, among all our people, that you must go and take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? It's the biblical way of saying, hey, they don't share (laughs) our faith. They don't share our traditions. They don't share our values. They don't share our God. Remember in the story of Ruth where she says, your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. That ain't Samson, right? He's going the opposite, opposite direction of this. He is got his eyes set on a Philistine woman. Next verse, we're continuing. But Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. There's the phrase, right? 
he has succumbed to the culture of his day, where everyone did what was right in their eyes. Verse 4, his father and mother did not know, this is a parenthetical statement here, his father Manoah and his wife, his father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord, for he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. Because at that time, the Philistines ruled over Israel. I think it's interesting that the Bible points this out as a point of narration. Was that here's a situation where these two parents have raised their son. They tried to commit to do everything right. And then he kind of takes a sideways turn and things are not panning out the way that they had hoped. The way that they thought it was going to go. And some of our eyes, well, we would think... Where did I go wrong? Right? Things are going wrong. This is not the way my son was supposed to turn out. That the narrator here lets us know God was still in charge. God was still in charge the entire time. Did you know that even a rebellious child can be part of God's plan? When it doesn't make sense to you, look at this. Sometimes even godly parents (laughs) don't always see God at work. And that's just the truth. And we see that here in this story. Let's continue reading. Uh, Verse five, then Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah and they came to the vineyards. Remember, he's not supposed to go around a vineyard. They came to the vineyards of Timnah and behold, a young lion came toward Samson roaring. Next verse, the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. Although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion in pieces as one tears a young goat. But he did not tell his father or mother what he had done. This is the first rift you will find in Samson's relationship with his godly parents. Why? Because Samson's not supposed to touch anything dead. I can't tell my parents what I just did. It was pretty awesome, but I can't tell them what I did. Because I just broke the vow. He broke the vow going to the vineyards, right? Now he's broken his vow killing an animal. Next verse 7. Then Samson went down and he talked with the woman. Here it is again. And she was right in Samson's eyes. Don't do it. Verse 8. After some days, Samson returned to take her. And check this phrase out. And he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion and honey. Verse 9, he scraped it out onto his hands and he went eating as he went. And he came to his father and his mother and he gave some to them. And they ate. Verse 9, but he didn't tell them that he had scraped the honey from the carcass of a lion. Rift number two, right? You start to see this relationship break down because of Samson's choices. Samson thinks he knows what's best for Samson. He wants the girl that's right in his eyes. He goes to a place he shouldn't do. He touches an animal he shouldn't touch. But hey, in the middle of it, he got some honey. Now, there's nothing wrong with eating honey. In fact, he's supposed to eat honey. He's a Nazarite. Remember John the Baptist was a Nazarite, Val, right? Locusts and honey. There was nothing, I mean, religiously, he was supposed to eat honey. But what I want to point out to you here in this little paragraph, what I didn't have time to get to last week, I want to give you three important lessons we learn about temptation from this little tiny story, just from a few sentences here. Number one, context matters. Context matters. There's nothing wrong with eating honey, but you had no business getting your honey from there. He got the honey from something he wasn't supposed to touch. He got the honey from a place he wasn't supposed to be. 
Adam and Eve saw that the fruit of the tree was, it was good. The problem is it came from the tree they're not supposed to touch. The context matters. My wife and I are going to celebrate 15 years married in a couple months. Thank the Lord. I suppose I should get her something. There's, no, there's nothing wrong with buying, giving my wife some diamond earrings. But if I rob the jewelry store to give her those earrings... You see, the context matters. We cannot get caught up in trying to find something good in a sinful situation. And we fall prey to this. Sometimes we use our Christianity as an excuse to, to, to go places we shouldn't go. Well, I'm witnessing. There's that new person at work, and I just need to share the love of Jesus with her. No, you don't. No. Context matters. Some people want the blessings of marriage outside the context of marriage. Should I stop? No. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, listen, context matters. There's nothing wrong with honey, but don't get your honey from there, all right? Listen, if you had to sin to get your blessings, you aren't blessed. If you had to sin to get your blessings, you are not hashtag blessed, Okay? Don't be fooled when celebrity so and so talks about how blessed they are. Don't be fooled when, when church folks so and so talk about how blessed they are if they've received their blessing in a context <laughs> that they shouldn't have been in in the first place. Okay? I'm just saying. Honey, good. Honey from the carcass. Mm-mm. He knows it. That's why he can't tell his parents where he got it, right? Lesson number two, we learn about temptation. I'm going to violate some bro code here, but a lot of men like to think it don't hurt to look. <laughs> Lesson number two, yes, it hurts to look. It hurts to look. Notice the, the language there. That the, that the writer says, says that, um, I'm looking back in uh, verse, what verse were we in? Verse 9, no, no, verse 8. It says, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. I love grammar and diagramming sentences, and uh, I know, whatever. But if you were to diagram this sentence, what's the verb in the sentence? Turned. Samson turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. He stopped to have a look. He stopped to have a look. That's not going to hurt anybody, is it? I know the game's on, it's halftime, the cheerleaders are coming out. I'm going to just stop and have a look. You're scrolling through her Instagram, let me just stop and have a look. It doesn't hurt to look. You see, again, just man to man, we have this, this weird, irrational thing in our head where we get caught doing something, we like to play dumb, right? I don't know how it happened. God confronted Adam in the garden. He's like, I don't know. She gave it to me, right? As if he wasn't there, stopping to have a look. Moses had to confront Aaron about the golden calf. And Aaron literally says, we threw some gold in a fire and a calf came out. I don't know where this came from. He says that. (laughs) 
Temptation is not simply something that happens to you. It's something that happens to you when you stop to have a look. Bathsheba did not present herself to King David. The Bible says he lingered to have a look. It hurts to look. In fact, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, brothers, don't even look. Matthew 5, 28, 29. He says, don't look. He says, and if your eyes have a problem looking, it is better for you that your eyes would be gouged out. I think Jesus knows something about Samson. Wait till we get to the next chapter. You'll find out what happens to Samson's eyes. That's why Job says in Job 31, verse 1, he says, I've made a covenant with my eyes not to even look. That's deep. We talk about having Proverbs 31 women. We need some Job 31 men that make a covenant with their eyes to not even look. It's hard, I know. But the scripture says, Samson, he was going on his walk and he turned aside to see. And lo and behold, there was some honey. Lesson number three we learned from this. Don't be fooled, your private sin affects your relationships. It does. Even when you think it doesn't, it does. See, Samson's already got a broken relationship with his parents. He's already, he can't tell them that he killed a lion. Now he can't tell them where he got the honey from. He's got secrets piling up now. And it's going to take its toll on his personal relationships. We know that Samson's parents did not approve of his choices to marry the Philistine woman. Like last week, we called her Phyllis, right? They did not approve of him marrying Phyllis. But I want you to see what they do in the very next verse. Judges 14, verse 10. But Samson's father, Manoah, went down to Phyllis. Samson prepared a feast there for so the young men used to do. And as soon as the people saw him, they brought 30 companions to be with him and they proceed to throw a wedding feast. Manoah, Samson's father, did not support this. He did not approve of this. He did not condone this. But don't miss this part of the story. Did you know You can still be kind even when you disapprove of somebody's choices. That's hard. A lot of parents have to deal with this, especially with adult children, I'm sure. When do you cut them off and say, no more, I'm done with you? Manoah didn't do that. Samson knew. Manoah told him. You're wrong for this. But he still went down there anyway. He still went down there anyway. To throw the wedding feast for Samson and his wife. Next, verse 12. And Samson said to them, oh, well, let me set this up real quick. It says that they brought out 30, 30 guys, right, to come celebrate with him. 30 companions for Samson. You will find out very quickly, they are not his companions. They are not his people. They're her people, all right? But they brought 30 companions for him and he decides to have a little fun with them. Now, presumably at these feasts, if you know Jesus and turning the water into wine, you know these feasts usually would have alcohol. Samson, you're not supposed to do this. And here he is, he's got 30 guys, and he gets a little cocky, and he says to them here in verse 12, let me now put a riddle to you. If you can tell me what it is within the seven days of this feast and find out, 
I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. Verse 13, but if you can't tell me what it is, then you shall give me 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. And they said to him, well, put your riddle that we may hear it. And here's the riddle. Verse 14, out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. Now we know the story. We know what the riddle is, right? We know what he's talking about. He's talking about the honey and the lion. And I'm sure he thinks his secret is secure. They'll never figure this out. I'm a Nazarite. They'll never figure it out that I got honey from the carcass of a lion. So he thinks he's outsmarted everyone. He thinks he's clever. He thinks he's about to get 30 new outfits, right? By the end of the week, the scripture says that after three days, they still could not solve it. Verse 15, so on the fourth day, <laughs> they said to Samson's wife, entice your husband to tell us what the riddle is, lest we burn you and your father's house with fire. Have you invited us here to impoverish us? Because you see, these were her people. These were Philistines. Samson is marrying a woman that does not share his faith. That means she does not share the allegiance to truth or to the Lord, even to her husband. Did you know non-believers don't play by the same rules as believers? It's not rocket science. But watch out for you get entangled with a non-believer in a marriage. They may have some allegiances and some, some, some other forces pulling the strings, I'll say, that are beyond their control. We just sang about it, that the, the sin has no, no hold on me anymore. You see, the Philistines still had a hold on her. And they could pressure her and threaten her they threatened to burn down her house where her father is. Now, who's at her house right now? Manoah. Yeah. So they threatened her. And so she succumbs, verse 16, and Samson's wife wept over him. And she said, you only hate me. You do not love me. You have put a riddle to my people and you have not told me what it is. Hmm. It's a game, isn't it? And he said to her, look, I haven't even told my mom and dad. Why would I tell you? It's a secret. It's a secret. Verse 18, and the men of the city... I'm sorry. Yes. Verse 18. And the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, Samson, what's sweeter than honey and what's stronger than a lion? Wouldn't you know they figured out the riddle? I wonder how. There could be a fourth lesson on temptation in this, and that is whatever your secret private sin is, sooner or later you're going to tell on yourself. Samson told on himself, and he told Phyllis the answer, and what did she do? She blabbed it to the other 30 guys. After all, they were her people. She said it. Those are my people. Sometimes your secret your secret sins, not only will get found out, but in the case of Samson, they get found out first by the people, the last people on earth you want to know. <laughs> they get found out by the people who don't like you. These guys were not there for Samson. They did not like him 
And they found out the answer to the riddle. Verse 18. So Samson says to them, and excuse my language, he says, if you had not plowed my heifer, you wouldn't have known the answer to this riddle. And yes, that phrase in Hebrew is as offensive as you think it is. He had some nasty words to say about the, that woman. So now he's mad at her. He's mad at them. He lied to his parents. He's betrayed by his wife. He's mad at the party. The word is out. All because he stopped to have a look. He turned aside to see the carcass. A little sin goes a long way. Next verse, 19, we're almost done here. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him and he went down to Ashkelon. Remember, they're in the city of Timnah. He goes to another town, Ashkelon, and he struck down 30 men of the town, took their spoil and gave the garments to those who had told the riddle. Remember what I said about stealing the diamond earrings to give to my wife? Look at Samson. He just went and we presumably killed 30 random dudes in another town, took their clothes and gave it to the Philistines. Samson, who's not supposed to touch dead bodies. His vows are becoming more and more worthless as the day goes on. He hadn't even finished his wedding yet. Talk about the wedding from you know where. Right? So he killed a lion. He goes through the vineyards. He takes honey from a carcass. He has an al uh, alcohol-filled party. He kills 30 people. It's all falling apart for Samson. Verse 19, the Bible says that in hot anger, he went back to his father's house. He was, he was mad. And he went home. And this chapter ends with a cliffhanger. Look at the last sentence. And Samson's wife ran off with his best man. Samson's wife married his best man. Here's where it gets interesting. Samson doesn't know it. That's next Sunday. When Samson finds out his wife isn't his wife. She married his best man instead. And the thread keeps getting pulled out of the sweater. As more and more it comes undone. You see, the man who was keeping a lot of secrets, you'll find next week, does not like secrets being kept from him. Samson. It's a wild story. We didn't even get to the good part yet.